evening, everybody, and welcome all of you to the live program number 117 at Orthopedic Principles. We are back with our exceptional faculty, Dr. Krishna Kumar from North Cumbria University Hospitals, United Kingdom. If you have noticed, Dr. Krishna Kumar has earlier lectured with us, and that was a fantastic lecture. And today, he's going to talk on technical reviews for locking plate failures in proximal humerus fractures so that we all learn better. So today, it's my honor to introduce you to Dr. Krishna Kumar from North Cumbria University, United Kingdom. Over to you, Krishna. Thank you, Hitesh. Uh, good to be back. Um, the reason I thought we'd do this particular topic is um, normally in webinars, you do see um, techniques and tips on how to do something well. It's very rare that we look at failures and discuss about it. I personally believe you learn a lot more from a failure than you would do from a successful case. So thanks for the introduction. This is, will be an autopsy. We look at a couple of cases, see what went wrong, um, see what could be done, what's in and what's out in locked plating. And we look at the future of locked plating too. Bear in mind, um, to make this lecture more specific and interesting, I'm going to limit this purely to locked plating. We will not be discussing nails, reverse shoulders, hemiarthroplasties, or conservative management. Um, because there's ample information to be had. And I think if you focus on a subgroup, we tend to learn a lot more than you would from a general topic. So off we go. So this is case one. Oh, before I start again, I should say thank you to all my uh, colleagues and from all the places I've worked before um, for being generous enough um, to allow me to put their cases on. Um, this was from about 10 years ago from one of my fellowships, 59-year-old um, man. Um, that was the fracture. You should bear in mind, looking at the x-ray, you might think, uh, why not? Why can't it be conservative? Uh, bear in mind, this was worth 10 years ago before the proffer trial came out. That's the other view as well. Uh, he underwent open reduction internal fixation. It was with a deltoid split. That was the immediate x-ray post-op. Um, and then, Two weeks later, when he came for his follow-up, that's what's happened. We'll talk in detail about what happened, and I'm just going to show you the um, axial or the lateral view, and you can see the angulation there. So for whatever reason, the patient had a revision surgery in which the plate was left in situ, just a prominent screw was removed, but the fracture site was basically packed with iliac crest and bone substitute. Um, that was the x-ray at three months and at six months post revision, that was the image. I'm just going to show you three complications in the beginning. We'll go through the literature and then we'll come at the end and we'll do the actual autopsy, yeah? Case two is a 74 year old Caucasian lady. She's otherwise active independent. I think looking at that x-ray, most of us might agree that it's a good indication for uh, doing something. And uh, in this case, it's a completely off-ended, looks like a two-part fracture, looks to be good bone. So they made a decision to go in, uh, put a plate on it. And that's the only other image I have. And that's what's happened. But a month later, she came back. There was no trauma. There was no injury. That was the picture they got. So as you can see, um, there's not much information from the lateral, but the CT clearly shows a good chunk of the articular head fragment without any screws in it. So she went on to have a reverse shoulder, which healed. This is case number three. Uh, it's about, I think it's a middle-aged young, middle-aged person, quite active. That was the x-ray. Uh, that was the intra-op image. Um, and that's the lateral view. That's the axial, and that was the x-ray at six weeks. This particular patient apparently did not turn up for follow-up either at two weeks or at uh, four weeks. He came straight at X six weeks. There's a lot of callus seen, but as you can see, it's clearly cut out, and that was the final position at six months. So you've seen these three complications. The essential issue about a proximal humerus locking plate is you're trying to apply a two-dimensional plate 
to what is essentially a three-dimensional problem, yeah? And it's because of this that despite the best efforts and despite your best uh, surgical skill, proximal humerus still continues to be um, a fracture which does create the odd difficulty for surgeons. So I'm just gonna run through the basics of how to do a fixation and then we'll get on to the actual literature. So you can do it in different ways. You can do it on a Mecca table, reverse it. Um, you could just have to be sure of where your II is. Some people prefer it in a beach chair. So you can have the II coming in from the opposite side or you can have it coming in from the same side. It's just personal preference, I believe. I don't think it makes a difference really. Which approach, there are three to choose from, the standard workhorse deltopectoral, the split and the anterior acromial, which is especially the extended anterior acromial, which is now proving to be very popular for minimally invasive plating. Literature-wise, there's really no difference. The only issue with deltoid splitting is um, there's noted to be some difficulty with putting the calca screws because it comes exactly where your axillary nerve is. The advantage of a deltoid split is you do get access to the posterior tuberosity and the GT fragments. Deltopectral is the most widely used. It's the workhorse. Uh, it's got a long track record. But yes, uh, you can have difficulty in accessing uh, the GT fragment at times, um, especially with those nasty head splits, four-part fractures which come in. There's some literature which shows that deltopectral does better at one year with deltoid split, but the difference is not really significant to recommend one or other. And it's essentially a matter of what you're comfortable with. So with the DP, I'm not going to tell you how to skin a cat, but um, you essentially go uh, between the deltoid and the pec major, avoid dissecting in the bicepital groove. Don't forget the biceps tendon, uh, tenotomize it or tenodes it rather. It's a good idea to know how your deforming forces are so that uh, you end up looking a bit more skillful while in theater and it's easier to put the fragments back. The reduction of the tuberosities should be anatomic. Um, make sure to put your sutures in, put your sutures through the tendon bone intersection. Uh, you can use provisional wires to fix it. Uh, sometimes when it's all just split apart and uh, in four or five pieces, you can sometimes use the bicepital groove as a guiding line in order to get your fragments together and uh, find out which part of the, an the anatomy goes where. You may have to disimpact the head with an elevator, get it out to length, especially in the valgus impacted fractures. Remember, this is a picture from Hertel in 2004. The tuberosities are very critical. Now, the thing is, most people have the impression because when you say the word tuberosity, you kind of tend to think it's like a little protuberance from the bone uh, and it's like a bump in the bone which we need to get back. And that's not true really. The tuberosities are an integral part of the proximal humerus and they connect the head and neck to the shaft. So if you don't get it together, like you can see in the picture on the right, you, if you want to put an, hold the egg in place, you need to get your egg cup properly back. And they do come with a circumferential suture. And this accounts for some of the round the world sutures you see with current uh, reverse shoulder replacements. Now, I mentioned earlier about the two-dimensional, three-dimensional thing. One common problem which happens with comminuted four-part fractures is the head often tends to fall back, yeah? And you're, you're essentially, as a surgeon, you're having a sort of AP kind of image and you often fail to appreciate it in a lateral or in a posterior view. And if the head does fall back, if it falls back more posterior, then you lose your internal rotation. Whereas if it does get anti-verted, as you saw in the initial x-rays, you lose external rotation, yeah? So unless you get it right, the patient is going to suffer in some way or other. Ideal plate position, it's been described um, quite often, just five to eight millimeter distal to the top of the GT, posterior to the groove. You can put the plate in a two ways. Either you can put your diaphyseal bicortical non-locking screw and then reduce the head and fragments onto the proximal part, or you can put all the proximal screws and then reduce the shaft onto it. Like I said, um, it's surgeon's preference. Now, 
which are the fractures you need to beware, the complex fracture types. I'm not going to go into classifications. I personally don't give much stock um, to classifications unless they prove helpful in management. Um, second is involvement of the medial calcar. Third, inadequate reduction. Number four, and actually which is more common, is inadequate technique. Wrong selection of cases still happens in this day and age. And those factors which are not strictly in a surgeon's control are cigarette smoking and alcohol. Now, what are the factors influencing failure? I've made like a top 10 list. Um, and I think if you just go through this list before every proximal humerus fracture, um, there's no way you'll, um, the, your chances of getting a failure would be less. Now the next shaft angle. Now, in, in terms of hips, when you do your hip reduction and get it, you pay a lot of importance to the neck shaft angle. In fact, hip surgeons do get apoplectic if they find a hip reduced in varus. Now, for somehow, for humerus, that importance to neck shaft angle doesn't seem to have materialized in practical life. I still see a lot of fixations in varus. So I'll talk a bit more about it down the slide. Second, the quality of your medial calcar reduction, getting your medial support and buttress out, quality of the tuberosity reduction, which I've already spoken about, number of screws in the head, distances of screw from the articular surface, plate position, supplemental fixation, either sutures, allograft, putting bone graft, intramedullary plates, or putting cages. And last but not the least are the uncontrollable factors, which I spoke about smoking and alcohol. Now, let's look at medial calcar. This picture is from Hertel's original article in 2004. And unfortunately, this it did not sort of get the importance it deserved. Um, so this was the other picture in which he actually documented that a fracture of the medial calcar and especially if the fragment is less than eight millimeters in the medial hinge, it affects not only the vascularity, but it also affects the practical reduction feasibility and stability, yeah? Now, let's look at where the medial calcar is. So it's those lower two arrows. And if that fragment is at least eight millimeters, because it's that's where the arcuate artery goes into the head, it was found to have a 97% positive predictive value for maintaining fixation. However, some other studies have disproved this as happens in literature quite often. Gardner says that in order to get your medial cortex stable, you need these four criteria. Either your cortex has to be intact or it has to be anatomically reduced and not comminuted. Or three, there has to be a stable head-on shaft impaction. Sometimes the medial is just blown out and the only way to get a stable reduction is to do a head-on shaft impaction. Number four is the calcar screw. Now, see in this picture, this is clearly one where the calcar is uh, fractured and affected, and they have actually put in a fibula, and there's a two beautifully positioned calcar screws, so that's actually maintaining the head in a good valgus position. Now, the second is the neck shaft angle, which I spoke about. So, if you look at the humerus, um, how you draw the neck shaft angle is you, you draw one line along the shaft of the humerus, the other goes along the anatomic neck, and you draw a line perpendicular to the anatomic neck, and that's the line which cross. So the normal is about 135. And evidence shows that if your fixation is less than 129 degrees, the chances of failure are much higher. So that's the paper which I was talking about. It came from a university hospital in Wales that all the patients who had a neck shaft angle of at least 129 degrees did not undergo revision. Whereas all the ones less than 129, not all of them, all the ones which underwent revision were found to have an angle of less than 129. Third is the calcar screw. A lot has been spoken about the calcar screw um, its position, its role. This has been proved not only in biomechanical studies, but in clinical retrospective studies as well. A lot of people have shown that uh, absence of calcar screws in indicated cases can result in a secondary uh, loss of reduction. 
Phytogam is actually, what he said was, if your screw is not within 12 millimeters of the apex of the inferior humeral arch, then your calca screw doesn't actually work. Okay, so this was actually a retrospective clinical study. So if you look at the picture on the right, there's no calca screw. Well, there is a calca screw, but essentially it's a position a bit too high. So there's nothing supporting the medial calca there. Whereas the screws on the left picture with the two black arrows show a correctly positioned calca screw and it's within a centimeter of the inferior humeral cortex, if that makes sense. So what I've started doing and changing in my practice is I start to put the calca screw first. We all know that the plates we use, the proximal locking plates, they all come with uh, guides and then you can put K wires which go on the top of the head and that's the ideal plate position. But you have to remember your ideal plate position is sometimes dictated by the quality of your reduction, yeah? So you might have the plate in the proper position, but because your reduction is not accurate, you find that, or because you have done a head-on shaft impaction, your calca screws may not be ideal. So once I've done the reduction, I generally position the calca screw first. I put in a KY through the calca screw hole, and that decides the position of the rest of the plate. Uh, I'll show you an x-ray again. You can see these with no calca screws in this one and the appropriate loss of reduction. Now, if you look at the, uh, the other principle, which they say about locking plates, was the screw should be divergent and spread out in the humeral head. Now, a lot of studies have shown that the humeral head, although it's like a little sphere, different areas of the head have different density. So the idea of diverging was to connect the areas of high density with the parts of the humeral head which have low density. And that's uh, what the previous style of fixation was. This concept has now changed and I'll be talking about the current uh, philos or the axos plates uh, towards the end of the lecture, but just keep this slide in mind. Number four is inadequate reduction. So either it's in varus or you haven't corrected the valgus, okay? So you may have these valgus impacted fractures like these, as you can see with the arrow, you need to elevate the humeral head and that gap can be seen only after reduction. Now, when you have a gap like that, it's um, not ideal to keep it just with a plate. You do need to put uh, a bone substitute into it or an autograft or an allograft, whatever works in your center. There's no real evidence to show that one works better than the other, although there is some evidence for putting an intramedullary fibula allograft in. Uh, GenX or calcium phosphate cement has shown good results in preventing collapse as well. Now, varus displacement, again, how do you prevent it? Varus actually creates more issues than valgus. You need to give your calca support with the screws, or calcium phosphate, fibula, femoral head, semitubular plate, cages, etc. There was a paper in 2011 which showed that they put semitubular plates in, which was a sort of cheaper version of putting a fibula allograft in. Now, it, it probably works, but my issue with it is when you come to the point of revising it or doing a joint replacement, uh, how are you going to handle that? So that's something which literature still has to show us. Number five is the number of screws, okay? Now, in a fracture, like you see on the right, you can put in about six, seven, your philos, you can put in about eight or nine screws. But on, now in a biomechanical model, the more screws you put in, clearly the more stable it is. But somehow that hasn't translated to a clinical picture. So, Studies have shown that if you have at least five screws, your chances of failure are very less. But increasing the number of screws beyond five or maximum six did not seem to increase your loss of reduction. This was probably because the more number of screws, it probably inhibits the biology of fracture healing or more number of screws into the head means there's less bone between screws. The literature still needs to come out on that one. Now, on the left is the philos plate, which you see, and it's actually divided into four zones. Yeah, zone one, two, three, and four. And each of these shows a different screw direction. So zone one and zone four, the screws are both sort of parallel to each other. In zone two, they diverge by a large angle. 
And in zone three, these are converging screws. So if you take a picture like that and assume you're looking at the position of the humeral head and that's anterior and that's posterior, that's screw number one, that's screw number two, it's number three, four, five, six, seven, and those are the Calca screws at eight and nine. Now, these are the current positions of the humeral head. Now, screw lengths are a big problem. Yeah, the other thing I wanted to mention actually when going back is um, if you look at the human body, I mean, if you're doing orthopedics, you'll find that there's no other bone where you have to put in so many screws into an eccentric sphere. Um, every other bone in the body, if you do an ankle, a forearm, a tibia, a femur, um, you put in one screw, you roughly know the length of the others and how it's going to go. So that's what makes putting screws into proximal humerus a very tricky proposition. And I'll be coming back to this slide at the end to discuss some newer concepts. Yeah. So screw lengths. Now, this is what I call the devil's dance because you're between the devil and the deep sea. If you put your screws very long, you risk screw penetration. If you put them too short, you don't engage the subchondral bone and you risk a loss of fixations. And these two are often the most frequent cause of revisions. And this is one of the things actually which makes proximal humerus uh, rather challenging. So the idea is you place your screws five to 10 mm from the articular surface, yeah? So as you can see in this one on the left, picture on the left, you have only two screws which seem to be close the rest of the three don't seem to be doing well at all. I found this paper from China, which looked at a computer model and uh, this looked at normal humeri. And if you look, the average screw length, it's slightly more in males, it's average at about 43. And they've looked at each screw. The Calca screws tend to be the longest between 47 to 48. The other interesting finding was the taller the person is, the longer his proximal humerus screw tends to be. So it's a good idea to know these values. Generally, it'll give you a basic idea in your mind, depending on your screw position, what approximate length you need to be putting it in. The problem comes because its measurement is quite difficult. When you drill a proximal humerus, you don't get the usual tactile sensation and feedback which you get when you put in. So that's why you have to re rely a lot on fluoroscopy and on different views as well. Some people use the blunt end of a KY to measure. Um, I personally just drill the lateral cortex and then I use a probe um, just to guide the length of the screw and estimate of the screw length. Now, suppose your screw has penetrated. What do you do now? I think the tendency for most of us is to try and put a shorter screw, but this study shows that if you do that, your subchondral bone has already been violated, so the mechanical buttress of the screw is lost. So they recommend to put a new track, which is why the polyaxial uh, plates are coming into vogue now. Um, still, some of the plates we use are still monoaxial, uh, fixed monoaxial, and uh, that's not really ideal. And so if your screw does not, is, does not, is not holding the subchondral bone, then it's not able to resist the varus moment of the cuff, yeah? If your screw has penetrated, and if it's more than 3 mm, clearly that requires revision. And that 3 mm basically reflects uh, the articular cartilage depth. Plate position. Now, this is uh, quite an interesting study. So um, if you look at the position of the plate. Ideally, we said it should be, it should be about a five to eight millimeters from the top of the GT. So this particular computer modeling study found that if you plate, if you put the plate a little more proximal, you are at risk of impingement, yes, but that apparently reduces the strain on the screws. And if you put your plate slightly more distal, um, that apparently increases the strain on the screws as was demonstrated by the slide by the red and green areas, if you see. So sometimes the ideal plate position is dictated by the configuration of the fracture, by the amount of bone loss, by the virus of the head. Or, and again, as I said, it depends on the reduction if you have got, if you have, do not have a proper neck shaft angle, uh, 
if you haven't restored your neck shaft angle well, even if you put the plate in the proper position, you'll find that your calca screws are not engaging the right track. So last is bone density. Now, the proximal humerus has often been compared to an egg, which, which has a sort of eggshell-like exterior and a less robust interior. And the BMD essentially decreases from outside to in, yeah? And this paper from Tingart actually said that if you measure the cortical thickness of um, the humeri, and if it's less than four millimeter, the, it's a significantly lower bone mineral density can be predicted. Now, Tingart also published this very interesting study. So he divided the humeral head into sort of five areas. So superior anterior, superior posterior, central, and the inferior anterior and posterior. And bone density studies have shown that the posterior superior area, uh, that's that one, that's the one which has the highest bone mineral density as compared to the others. And the superior anterior is the weakest. And the next, the second strongest in terms of bone density was the inferior medial fragments as well. And this is where your calca screws goes in. So the posterior superior fragment was supposed to resist extension moments and the anterior inferior does resist flexion moments. So a number of other authors have confirmed this in biomechanical studies. Now, can we confirm this in clinical studies? So this is where the difficulty comes in. Um, the stability of the proximal humerus, as I've shown you, depends on a large number of factors and isolating the placement of screws in the posterior superior part is perhaps beyond uh, the realm of a clinical study. So that brings us to the question, should we be having new plate configurations? Now, if the posterior superior part of the humeral head is the strongest, why don't we place our screws this way? So if you do it this way, you have about three screws in the posterior superior fragment. Whereas if you recall the slide where I showed you before, the current screw position in the humeral head is like that. And you have an area there which is not covered. So, I mean, if you think about it in hip fractures, for example, you put your DHS in essentially in the central or slightly inferior posterior position. And the idea is that's where the strongest bone is. So shouldn't we be applying that concept to a proximal humerus? Again, this is where polyaxial plates will help um, if there is about 10, 15 degrees of movement, you may be able to engage more fragments in the posterior superior part of the humeral head. So now routinely, um, as a part of practice, in addition to placing my calca screw first, I make sure that I'm engaging a couple of screws into the posterior superior segment of the humeral head to get a bit more stability. So to get an idea, I'm going to show you this 3D recon and we'll see where this goes. So if you see, that is the part where you need to get your maximum number of screws in the postural superior part of the humeral head. And you can see as it rotates and comes around, um, these uh, got very well positioned calca screws in this particular model. So as I said, a number of authors have confirmed that the posterior superior part is significantly strong and putting calca screws also significantly increases the number of cycles. So you place your screws in the calca inferior aspect, um, proximity to the joint surface to avoid articular penetration and subchondral hold is necessary as well. Now, fluoroscopy is of uh, great importance. See, uh, the other thing they found when they studied a cutout screws was the posterior superior part is the part where the screws do tend to cut out the more because this part is very difficult to visualize in fluoroscopy. So they recommended if you keep your arm in about 20 degree flexion and 80, 90 degree internal rotation, you get to see the posterior superior part on an AP view and with a perpendicular beam. And that'll help you screen for any prominent screws. Uh, I've personally found that doing a live fluoro in an axillary view also helps because that's where, again, you find some of your longer cutout screws tend to be. Yeah, you're on the risk of that as well. Now, 
let's start the actual autopsy. So let's go back to all the cases we have done. I'm going to show you a few other cases which uh, I have done as well. And then I'll show you a bit about um, the future of where we are going to with uh, lock plating. So if you remember this picture, so you look at the screw lengths, it's clear that these screws are inadequate in terms of length. You can see that the greater tuberosity is gapped. It's not reduced there well. You have, I've sure told you before that the tuberosity does need to be impacted and reduced very nicely and maintained. Again, short screws. To be fair, this Calca screw is actually in a reasonable position, but um, I think one Calca screw just did not do the trick over there. And uh, there is no medial cortical support. Now let's look at this one with intraop images. Again, you can see in the calca area is left. Um, there's no support in the medial calca, but luckily I think in that case, the medial calca was not very comminuted, although it was broken. Again, those screws there are very short. There are basically two screws holding the subchondral fragment and the rest of the screws are not engaging the subchondral bone. The plate is rather high. And that's probably the reason why the calca screws are not in the right place. So if the plate was a bit lower, you would have found that it would have engaged uh, the calca fragments better. Here is what I mentioned, and this is my bugbear, which is about the neck shaft angle. Um, so in this one of these failures, you look at the neck shaft angle, which were measured, it's about 117 degrees. And as I mentioned in the literature, you need at least uh, in the lower 130s um, to get a good reduction and prevent your chance of uh, failure. So if you look at this picture again, uh, you remember Patty Gannis and a study about the calca screws. The calca screws have to be within 12 millimeters or within a centimeter of the inferior humeral surface. If they are not, it doesn't work. This plate is actually positioned quite nicely, but because of the altered neck shaft angle, the calca screws do not stay in their ideal position. And uh, that was the lateral uh, view and that's clearly anti-verted and he's going to lose his, uh, the patient is going to lose some rotation there. Um, looking at this one, this actually looking at the fracture and looking at the initial fixation, there's, so if you analyze it, it's got adequate number of screws. It's got two very good calca screws. The screws, most of the screws seem to be uh, near the subchondral bone. It does seem to have a good hold. Nevertheless, when the patient came for follow-up, um, as you can see uh, where the arrow is pointing, the head has uh, tilted into varus. That was the initial picture. And then if you look at that, there's a tilt into varus there. But ultimately, this fixation stayed in place. It went on to heal. It, uh, and I think it's because of the two calca screws and because of the, all the other screws engaging the subchondral bone that this patient just ended up having a plate removal and uh, nothing else further. Now, this is the autopsy. I'm going to show you some cases where measuring the plate length might be very tricky. So you might get fractures like these where both the tops gone and the bottoms gone, young active fit patient, and you might have to put in plates like those because there's no other option uh, when you have fractures comminuted with um, GT and LT apart. So be very careful when measuring the plate length with these. I personally um, write down all the plate lengths on a marker board and intraoperatively, once I've done the reduction and reduced the shaft and reduced the surgical neck, I use an intraop tape measure. And I always, if I, if I come in between two plate length measures, I always take the slightly longer plate. Uh, you have to be careful of that because if you see the lower end, it can um, potentially go. This is, I think, the longest philos plate they had. Um, this was another one uh, where um, we initially thought of a nail, but in our institute at that point where I worked, we did not have um, a central entry nail like a polaris. We had a lateral curved nail. And if you see that slit going into the GT, it was a bit uh, unnerving to do it. And by the time we did it, this was four weeks down the line. So we got the screws in. Again, getting your plate length correct in these cases can be very tricky. So I recommend to know your plate lengths before, write them down, reduce the fractures, measure the plate length intraoperatively, and then um, get on with uh, 
um, reducing it. Um, this was another nasty one. Uh, these are one of the ones where you wonder uh, what you did to deserve this. A young patient with a four part um, with a head split fracture as well. Uh, not the nicest one you want to have. So you go through the standard delta pectoral approach, um, get in, get it looking to a humerus. And in this case, if you see, we could not, um, the calca screws were not in the ideal position because the plate is slightly high and the plate had to be positioned high um, in order to get uh, engagement in the fragments, but I've got head and shaft impaction. So that's the uh, importance. If your calca screws are not uh, you are not able to put the calca screws or if you are not able to put bone steps to it in properly, uh, put in, impact the head onto the shaft. I know a colleague, a surgeon in London, who also has a belief that all the screw lengths should roughly be end at the same surface, at the same level. Uh, his idea being that in that way, you're providing a uniform base on which the humeral head rests. If you put different screws of extremely different lengths, then what happens is um, you get different sort of pressure points and uneven um, a stress strain relation. So, but again, uh, that's something that's still just a theory and a personal opinion. It's not anywhere near the published uh, evidence bit. Sometimes you'll get them all like they're Humpty Dumpty. You can sit on a wall, you can have a fall and whatever you do, you just can't put them together again in which you rely on your old friends, either a hemiarthroplasty or a reverse shoulder or what works. So what is the future of locked plating? Now I've, I've told you that a locked plating is essentially a two dimensional approach to what is a three dimensional problem. Now you can solve that problem in one way and try to put in different implants. You can try to put in nails, you can put in cages, uh, you can try and fix in different ways, or you can improve your vision. And I believe 10 to 20 years down the line, this is how we are going to go. I'm gonna share with you some clips, which were my good friend uh, Bruno from Brazil was kind enough to share with me. And this is augmented reality with a Microsoft HoloLens. So you essentially wear the lens and then you operate and that's what your image is like. Another thing which has come into vogue is 3D printing. Um, so you 3D print your fracture, you import the images from DICOM, um, you device the plate and uh, to fix on it, and you can actually create your own templates. Uh, here in the United Kingdom, we have strict controls on what can be implanted or not, but I believe uh, in other places, uh, as long as the implant is sterile, you're still free to use your own designed uh, 3D templates. Now, uh, this last bit, what I'm going to show is the future. This is mixed reality, and this is what's going to happen in a couple of years from now. This is actual life surgery, and the surgeon has a, a three-dimensional image um, displayed as a hologram through his glasses. Have a look. Yeah, so that's probably the future where we'll end with several years from now. Um, so that brings us to the conclusion of the presentation. The idea of it um, has been to basically tell you, uh, give you a sort of checklist on what all you need to be doing when doing a locked plating for a proximal humerus fracture. Um, I've given you an idea of the, some of the latest uh, evidence there is and with an eye vision to the future. Uh, questions? Uh, thank you, Krishna, for an excellent presentation. And we all learn from failures, actually. And so that's why this lecture is very important. Because unless you learn from failures, you cannot go further. Yeah. Uh, a few questions. Uh, Krishna, do you think 
a usage of cancellous screws in the head fragment is advantageous because then you have the pitch that is large. I mean, you have the difference that's larger and that's going to have uh, more strength. Yes, I mean, well. if if you if you think about if you think about it theoretically, the proximal humerus essentially is is basically a shell with a lot of cancellous bones. So yeah, it makes theoretical sense if you put in cancellous screws which have larger pitch and diameter and there's more bone hole. But as I've shown you in biomechanical studies, it's it's not been shown to have a clear difference. So you have lock screws which provide an additional surface of fixation. Um, you, you can use your bone substitute. You can try and engage your screws in the postural superior fragment and in the calcar. And I believe that those are the two areas we should concentrate on. So more than, more than the cancellous cortical type of screw, I would focus on putting the screws in, in the right places where the bone mineral density is higher, getting your screw lengths appropriate, and more importantly, getting your reduction right. Because without getting your reduction right, uh, it, it, it's like a pattern. It, it just doesn't fall into place. Thank you for that. See, now there's a lot of discussion that happens in the proximal femur where you inject bone cement into the proximal femur for additional stability and purchase. So do you think, not bone cement per se, why can't we use calcium phosphate or some bone graft substitute as an injectable agent for better purchase? Do you think that makes sense? Yeah. Yeah, a lot of people do that actually. Um, there was some resistance to this initially when it came because it was theorized that the, the thermal reaction which occurs when you put cement in and it solidifies, that can cause local bone necrosis, but studies have shown that that does not happen. So I do know a lot of people who put in cannulated screws and then you inject cement through it or you inject, you position your plate, you inject the genics and bone cement in, and before it sets in, you fill it in with screws, or you use your screws in as a filler at the end. Um, I personally think it's a very good idea. I do it often, um, although it was there in some of the x-rays, although probably I didn't point it out, but I think using calcium phosphate cement, uh, particularly like Xenex, it's, it, it, it's a very good idea and it helps. And uh, see, suppose the screws, see what happens is when you use a cannulated screw, the uh, holes are at the tip of the screw. So if you have holes in between, so, so that the cement comes much earlier, what, what is your take on that? Sorry, I didn't, I didn't catch that. What's the point see, there? Uh, see, what happens is when you put in a can cannulated screw and you want to inject cement, mm. okay, the cement comes from the tip of the screw, right? Yeah. Yeah. So suppose you want to, suppose you have inserted the screw and if you have few holes somewhere in between the screw. Yeah, yeah. So, so that the cement spread doesn't yeah. occur at the tip, rather yeah. in between. Right, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's one of the problems with uh, doing that particular technique is if your, if your screw and has violated the joint and you perhaps haven't realized it, you essentially end up putting cement into the joint. So which is technically one of the things, which is one of the reasons why I do not use that particular technique. Although, as I said, I'm aware of some people who do. I personally prefer putting in all my screws first, getting their position right and filling the rest in areas with cement in. So that way I get a bit more control over where it goes. And I do it under fluoroscopy to ensure that the cement is not spreading where it shouldn't be like the joint surface. The other option is you can inject, see, in case you're planning for cement, for example, the severe osteoporosis, you put in cement and you put the screw before it sets in, isn't it? Yeah, as I said, that's the second option. And uh, some people do that as well, put cement in first and then put your screws in. And before it sets in, you put in six screws, it should be fine. Okay, the other question is regarding uh, the screw perforation into the uh, humeral head because I think that is one of the most common problems that can happen. So do you think that uh, uh, we can prevent it by taking the humeral head through all range of motions and check it intra-op and see up that like how you when you have a slip type of humeral epiphysis you put in a screw then you always have this problem of screw penetration. So one yes. thing I think would be to take through the entire range of motion and check in all directions. Isn't it? Yeah, 
So if you're doing, as I mentioned, if you're doing a live axillary fluoroscopic view, to get an axillary view, you're essentially having to get your arm up into that 1990 abduction position. So that actually runs through. And second, as I mentioned, if you want to see the postural superior part of the humeral head, you have to get your arm in about 80 to 90 degrees of internal rotation with about 30 degree flexion added in. So these two essentially equate to going through a range of movement and screening it. The, like I said, the sensitivity of fluoroscopy has been documented to be between 70 to 100%, which is the variation in literature. Um, what I've found personally is if you have a rough idea in your mind, like from that slide I showed, where you have, you know how much your screw length approximately is going to be. And then it's just a question of plus five, minus five that way. Um, currently at the moment, fluoroscopy seems to be the best way to determine your screw lengths. Uh, nothing else is proven to be as effective. And I think screening under fluoro is definitely the way to go. Krishna, the point that you made that the top two uh, screws and the bottom two screws are parallel and the others in between are convergent. That's a very, very important point that you mentioned. And out of those, which are the ones do you think we are at risk of perforation? I mean, yeah. what are the so chances? The, well, uh, prior to perforation, I can also add another point here. So again, studies have shown that if your screws are diverging or converging, or if they are at an angle to the plate, they provide better resistance to flexion extension moments than screws which are parallel. So that's one point. But like I said, the postural superior part of the humeral head has two distinct qualities. One, it's got high bone density, but second, it's the part where your screws tend to penetrate the most. So it's like in your distal radius, you need to be worried about the lunate fossa screws because of the, the way the lunate fossa is, it goes. Similarly for the proximal humerus, it's, so it'll be basically screw one, three, and five, which have a higher risk of perforation. And the ones which engage the postural superior. Having said that, I've seen calca screws, which are very long. I, I've personally had a calca screw, which, which I thought was in the neck, but it turned out to be out in a later view. So yes, it happens. It's, it's a tricky business and uh, we have to do the best we can. Yeah, see, when you mentioned about calca screw, I remember one of the slides which you said that the 12 millimeter rule, that means yeah. the screw should be within 12 millimeters from the humeral head, right? From the inferior surface, from the inferior surface of the uh, humeral okay. head, yes. So, is that particular screw at risk for penetration? Yeah, that's the, those are the calca screws. And uh, that's what I was talking about. Um, a lot depends on how your initial reduction is. If you've got your reduction neck shaft angle quite good, then the screw shouldn't be at a, a, a position of um, having to cut out. But if your reduction is not appropriate, then that's why, which is why I try and put those two screws first so that I screen it under fluoro, I hold my reduction up. If it's put with K-wire, put your calca screws in first, and that gives you a good resistance to various moments, and then you can tackle the rest of it. Rather than the traditional concept used to be work from the top and go your way down after positioning the plate. But I say, if you go from the bottom and work your way up, that actually gives you a better outcome. The calca screws are the seven and eight screws? Eight and nine, yeah, in the eight and, yeah. Eight and nine, yeah, okay. Yeah. The other one is, see, suppose you put a long plate. You've shown a few x-rays where you put a long plate. So when you put a long plate, are you concerned about the deltoid insertion? Yeah, so in order to put that long plate in, you have to take part of the deltoid insertion off, and then I often reattach it. So you don't, because the deltoid insertion is a fairly broad one, you just have to take the anterior half off for the plate to be on the lateral cortex. And then I often, sometimes I put in a suture anchor and suture it back. Other times I just stitch it back to the plate itself and it works well. Sometimes you get a little bit of heterotopic ossification where the deltoid has come off, but it's never a clinical problem. You think that doesn't affect function? Oh, no, not at all. Not at all. That little bit of deltoid doesn't affect your function at all. You know, Krishna, I had an interesting case actually. We had a very severe commutative head and proximal shaft fracture. And it was really bad. So what we did was we did a MIPO approach 
We used yeah. a Dell touch split. And again, I was really concerned about the delta insertion. So what we did is we twisted the plate 90 degree and yeah. got the distal part into the anterior part of the cubital shaft. Yeah. And luckily, yeah. it went on well and united wonderfully. Yeah. I yeah, I mean, it, it, it works. But um, yeah, that's definitely one way to go about it. But like I said, if you take off half the deltoid and reattach it, it does not cause you any functional issues at all. Sometimes, okay. you know, because sometimes some of those cases you saw, we got to operate at about three and a half, four weeks. So in order to get the reduction, you have to take off a bit of pec major, uh, reattach it, and you have to take off a little bit of the deltoid so that the plate can sit on the lateral surface. And uh, then as long as you reattach them, it should be fine. And if, uh, I mean, if you are not able to reattach to the exact location, you can just uh, switch it back to the plate, is it? Yeah, now you just put an anchor switch. As long as you maintain the length and the tension when you're suturing it back, it should work fine. Okay, Krishna, I think that's all the questions that we have. Thank you for the fantastic lecture, and I'm sure we can have more sessions in future. I mean, this was really enlightening because you really spoke about failures, and that's where we learn a lot more. Thank you okay. once again, Krishna, for joining us. Thank you for having me, Hitesh. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye-bye.